Today we're going to talk about a library called SQLite that allows you to access a database from Python. So last time we talked about SQL, Structured Query Language, and we said that we can use it to perform queries against the database. That is, we can ask questions and the database will answer them. Or we can insert data and create tables. And we learned about a lot of different operations that we can do. But we can do those only if we have direct access to the database. So now we're going to talk about how we can perform those queries from a Python script. We also talked quite a bit about different database management systems. And some of the database, database, database management systems, or DBMSs, that we talked about are listed here. MySQL, PostgreSQL, Oracle, Microsoft Access, and SQL Server. And also there's a database called SQLite that we're going to talk about today. So SQL is a great language, but how can we use it from Python? The answer is to use something called DBABI 2.0. Uh, what this is, it's a standard that the Python community came up with. It basically allows us to access a database in a standard way, no matter what kind of database management system is running in the back end. So uh, if I have a MySQL database, I can use DBABI 2.0, and um, it'll look just like it will if I'm using a Postgres database. And while there might be some features that are available in MySQL that aren't available if I'm using Postgres and vice versa, um, by and large, the way that I access everything is roughly the same. I only have to make a few changes when I port from one to another. We'll talk later about how I can get rid of all of those differences um, by using a different library that gives me even more abstraction. And one of the databases that's supported with DB API 2.0 is SQLite. And SQLite provides a very simple database interface. It's very simple, so it doesn't provide very many features. For example, there's no idea of a user account in SQLite. There, uh, there aren't any advanced queries. Uh, you might be able to do aggregation, but that's about it. Um, and there's no constraint checking, really. Um, not at the same level that there is in Postgres or MySQL. So we're not going to be able to do as much with SQLite. If we want to have a really advanced web application, we're going to need to move to MySQL or Postgres or maybe something more sophisticated like an Oracle database. However, SQLite has a lot of advantages. For one thing, it stores the entire database in a single file. And this is great because it makes it really easy to copy the database. Uh, if I want to back up the database, I just copy that file somewhere else on my disk or to a different disk, and I have a backup. And if something happens to my server and it fails, well, I can take my USB flash drive or whatever it is I stored the database on, plug it into a different computer, and I'm up and running again. It's also really easy to port from one server to another. If I decide, OK, uh, I've developed this on my home computer, but now I want to run it in the lab, I can copy the file over and run my script. And whoa, I've moved the database over to a different server. So it has a lot of advantages. Um, but it doesn't provide a network server. And this is both a blessing and a curse. It means that I can't directly access it over the network. Uh, I can't do remote access. But it also means that it's really easy to set up and configure because I don't have to worry about configuring all those network options. SQLite is also ACID compliant. ACID is a standard that we use to evaluate databases. So all good modern databases are ACID compliant. We say they pass the ACID test. Uh, ACID is an acronym that was uh, invented by Jim Gray in the 70s. Uh, and it stands for these four properties. The first one is called atomicity. And that just means that when we do some sort of transaction, when I'm inserting a bunch of records into a database, that transaction happens atomically. It either happens uh, entirely or it doesn't happen at all. So it's not going to insert, say, three records out of six into the database. It's either going to insert all six or none of them. And that way I can keep the database in a consistent state. In fact, the second criteria is consistency. Um, and that basically says that when I insert data into a database, I never violate any of the constraints I've placed on that data. So I'm never going to insert a negative value into a field that's supposed to be positive. Um, I'm never going to insert two records into the database that have the same primary key. Primary key is basically a unique number we use to identify um, a row in a database table. And um, so we should never have two values with the same primary key. A third property is called isolation. That basically says if I'm running two database queries at the same time, they don't interfere with each other. Um, the result is basically the same as if I ran the first one and then ran the second one. And it doesn't matter what order I ran them in, um, but I'm not going to kind of mix them together and get some weird third result. The last criteria is durability. And that basically says that when I store data, the data is stored permanently 
even if the database crashes, I'm not going to lose data. The only data I might lose is data that's in a pending transaction that hasn't been committed yet. But once I've committed that transaction, it's on the disk, it's safe, a crash won't delete it. So all good modern database systems are ACID compliant, including SQLite. So how do we use SQLite? Well, SQLite comes with a utility called SQLite 3. We're now on version 3 of SQLite. And so you can create a database by saying SQLite 3 and then the name of your database file. It's good style, although I don't think it's required, to name your file something.db. So here I'm creating a database named example.db. And this pulls up the SQLite utility. And we can now run SQL commands against this database. So for example, I can type in the command create table users and give it two fields, a name field and a password field that are both, 30, uh, both strings of thir uh, length 30. So 30 character strings for name and password. Um, I can also run other SQL commands like the insert into command that puts data into the database. Some of you did well with this on the quiz, some of you did not. Uh, so I can type insert into users of name comma password, the values Bob and insecure. One of the things I want to point out, I mentioned before SQLite doesn't have a lot of the features that some of the more sophisticated databases do. A database like MySQL or Postgres has a built-in hash function that will take a string like a password and uh, encrypt it so that you can in insert it directly into the database as an encrypted hash. And we can't do that in SQLite. So here I'm just putting the string insecure in as Bob's password. You would never do that in a production system. I will point out that even though we can't do that directly in the database, we will be able to do it in Python and then store it in the database using SQLite. Anyway, when you're done using the SQLite utility, you can get out of it by typing dot quit. Many of the commands that you can pass to the SQLite utility start with a dot. For instance, you can type dot help and hit enter to get a list of all the commands. But uh, when we want to quit, we just type dot quit. Now, if we want to connect it to a script, uh, we can do that. SQLite was written in C, and it's really designed to be used with a C program or a C++ program. Um, but there are bindings that kind of wrap that C library um, in a different language. So for example, there's a Python binding package that will allow us to access SQLite from Python, even though SQLite itself is written in C. So to pull in the SQLite bindings, you just, in your Python script, say import SQLite 3. And that will pull in the SQLite 3 wrapper. And now we can start interacting with the database. So DP API 2 says that um, the first thing that we do is we call a function named connect. So we're going to uh, say SQLite3.connect, and we're going to pass in as a string um, the name of the database file. And that function is going to return a database connection object. And we're going to call functions on that object. So we're going to say DB equals SQLite3.connect the name of the database, which in this case is example.db, and then uh, that gives us the database object. So um, if we were connecting to a database, you know, a Postgres database or a MySQL database, a lot of things would happen here. We'd open up a network connection and that could fail. We'd have to handle errors. But SQLite's nice and simple. We just open the file, and if we have permissions, we're good. So if we want to actually interact with the database, we can't do that directly through the database connection object. We have to create another option called a, uh, object called a cursor. And the way we get the cursor is we call the cursor function in the database object. So cur gets db.cursor will actually create a cursor object for us to use. Um, basically, a cursor is a way of keeping track of a single database transaction. So if I want to insert 30 records into the database, I create a cursor. I loop through those 30 records and insert them. And when I'm done, I'm going to commit the entire transaction to the database. If something goes wrong and it fails, it's going to abort the transaction so it won't have inserted any of those records. And then that way, we can make the transaction be atomic. So the cursor sort of keeps track of um, one running transaction. And now that I've got my cursor, I can actually run SQL queries. So I do that using the execute function. So here I can say cur.execute, and I just pass in my query as a string. So for example, here I can create a table. I can say create table birthdays that has a name column that's text and a, a date column named day. So this is uh, performed in a sort of temporary database until we commit the transaction. Right? The cursor remembers what we did, but it doesn't actually send it to the database until we commit. And to commit, we say db.commit. Notice that the commit function 
is not a function of the cursor. It's a function of the database connection. So we might have a whole bunch of cursors running, and when we commit, all of the cursors get committed. Um, if we run into some sort of error and we decide we don't want to commit the transaction, we can abort it or undo it by calling the rollback function instead. So we can say db.commit to commit it or db.rollback to remove the pending transaction. So suppose I want to actually run a query, a select query, and get some information from the database. Um, how can I pass information into my query so that I can uh, maybe say look up, uh, in this case, somebody's contact information? Well, I have to use placeholder syntax. Placeholder syntax means that for each value I'm going to supply to the query, I'm going to put a question mark into the query. So here's an example. Um, I'm going to get a, a name from some web form. So I'm going to call form.getValue of name, and that will retrieve what the user typed in as their name in the form. Then I'm going to call the execute function on my database cursor, and my query is going to be select. I'm going to select the name, address, and phone. So these are the three things I'm going to print for every record that matches my query. I'm going to fetch that information from a table named users. But I'm only going to fetch rows that satisfy this where clause, this query that says the name is, and notice I put a question mark in. Python is going to replace that question mark with the name that we got from the web form. How does it know? Well, I put a list, notice the square brackets, around my name variable. And that's basically a list of things to put in for the question marks. So the first thing in the list is going to get put in for the first question mark. The second thing in the list will get put in for the second question mark. Each question mark will get replaced by the next thing in the list. So that's what I've got here. Um, in this case, I only have one question mark, and there's only one thing in my list, so it's going to put the name in. So for example, if I typed Bob into the name field of the web form, the complete query would be select name, comma, address, comma, phone from users where name equals Bob. Um, by the way, Python will put the quote marks in for you, by the way. It, uh, it looks at that string that you typed in. It does automatic escaping to prevent SQL injection attacks, which we'll talk about at some point, And it puts in the quotes for you. Very nice. Um, we can also perform other select queries. So here I can do a more simple query. I can say select name from movies where year is greater than 20. And I notice I am missing a double quote. That is not good. Let's fix it. I'll fix. So select name from movies where year is greater than 20. Once I've retrieved that information, I need some way to get it. To do that, I call the fetch all function. Um, so db.fetchall, or actually I can call this on the cursor too. I could say cur.fetchall will actually fetch um, information from the database. And it's going to store it in a Python list named rows. So I can loop through that list of rows. Um, and each of the rows is also a list containing each column of the database. So here I can say the name is in row sub 0. So print out that the name of the movie is name. Uh, I should point out fetching data is actually a separate step from running the query. We run the query first with execute, and then we fetch the query with fetch all. And um, the fetch function returns a list of lists. Technically, it's a list of tuples, but that's close enough. So uh, to summarize a little bit, there's actually two fetch functions that are provided by the cursor object. There's the fetch all function that fetches all the rows that match. And then there's the fetch one function that just fetches one row at a time. If you call fetch one over and over, like in a loop or something, it'll give you one row, and then it'll give you the next row, and then the next row. So that's one way that you can get data from the database. Typically, we'll use fetch all in this class. Um, when you do that, like I said before, it fetches a list of tuples or a list of lists. And that's often really cumbersome because you have to say a row sub 0, row sub 1. And you have to remember which column is column 0, which column is column 1. So a more convenient way is to have it fetch a list of dictionaries, where the dictionaries map the column name to the value for that column. And to do this, we have to change what's called the row factory. So for example, if I create a database by saying db equals sqlite3.connect example.db, I can then say db.rowfactory equals sqlite3.capital R row. And this changes the factory to be the sqlite3 row factory, which by default provides both dictionary and tuple access. So we can now access the elements of a row using the column name. Here's an example of that. 
I'm going to create my cursor with cur gets db.cursor. Then I'm going to use my cursor to execute the query select name and age from users. So I'm getting a name and an age field. Then I call curs.fetchall to get all the rows that, uh, meet, that match the query. Then I loop through my rows with four row in rows. But instead of saying row sub 0, row sub 1, row sub 2 now, I can just say print, and I print the name, plus, and I can say row sub, and in double quotes, the name. So this will fetch the name using the column name, which is name. That's a lot of names in one sentence. I'm sorry that that's confusing. I could also say row sub age in double quotes, and that would fetch the age from the row. So when you're done, you should clean up after yourself. And we do that first by committing and then closing the cursor and closing the database. Uh, this is really good programming style. It's important that you have good programming style. But it also frees up resources. If you have too many cursors open at the same time, you're going to be using lots of memory. Your program is going to start to get slow. Um, we call this a memory leak. It's not a good thing. So uh, it's important to do it for those reasons. It's also important because if you don't commit on a regular basis, your data may not actually make it to the database. It may be cached in memory. And until you commit it, it uh, may not actually be stored in disk. And so if your program crashes, the data goes away. So commit often. Uh, even if we do this, we have to worry about errors. If the program encounters an error, it's going to generate an exception. And that's going to interrupt the normal flow of the program. That's what an exception is. It's something that interrupts the normal flow of a program. So this can cause your data not to make it all the way to the database. So there's actually a better way to do this um, that's considered more Pythonic. And in recent versions of Python, they've added some special features to make this very easy. And the way that you do that is you use something called the with keyword. So instead of saying db equals sqlite3.connect, you can say this. You can say with sqlite3.connect, example.db, as db colon, and then we indent. And what's going to happen is Python's going to run all that code that we indented after it opens the database. And if it ever leaves that block of code, if we stop indenting or if an exception happens, it's going to automatically commit and close the database. So um, this is a good thing. This means that we're always going to commit whether there's an error or not. So let's put all this together to make a simple web application. Um, I actually run a game on my server at home. Uh, I started it way back in 1997, something like that. It's a text-based adventure game based on the Chronicles of Narnia. And anybody can log on to it. You just need to tell that client. And you can connect to narnia.homeunix.com on port 9999 um, and make a character and explore the world of Narnia. Um, but suppose that I want to keep some statistics about the different pieces of armor that I have in the game. So I've got shields and breastplates and helmets. And I want to know how many uh, helmets I have that are at level 10 and how many that are at level 2. Uh, there's really three things I want to keep track of. I want to keep track of the name of the armor. I also want to know how much damage it absorbs and how much damage it deflects. And using that, I can figure out if it's a good piece of armor or a bad piece of armor, kind of what level player it's for. So the first thing that I have to do is to make a database with SQLite. So I'm going to make a directory named armor example, and I'm going to put my code in there. And I can create the database by saying SQLite 3 space armor.db. This is going to create a new database file named armor.db. And it pulls up that database in the SQLite utility. And then I get an SQLite prompt. The computer prints that. I don't type it. And I type an SQL command. I type create table armor of name text comma absorb integer comma deflect integer. I'm creating a new uh, database table named armor that has three columns. The first column is a name. And it's just text. And then the other columns are the amount of absorption and the amount of deflection that the armor provides. And those are just numbers. They're going to be percentages. Now uh, let's use Jinja to make some templates for displaying the data from the database. So I'm going to start with a base template. This is uh, very similar to what I showed you when we talked about Jinja. I'm going to have my doc type tag and my HTML tag and my head and title tags and my body tags and my slash HTML at the very bottom. The only thing that's really interesting is that in my body, I've put a Jinja block named contents, and that's going to get overridden by my other template. So my other template is going to be named form.html, and it's going to extend base.html. And I'm just going to replace the contents block with first a list of all the armors that are in the database, and then a form that lets us put a new armor into the database. 
So uh, I start with an H2 tag that says Armor Database. And then I'm going to have an unnumbered list. And inside, I'm going to use a Jinja for loop to loop through all of the different pieces of armor in the database. And I'm going to print out row sub 0, which will be the name, has row sub 1, that'll be the absorption, percent absorption, and row sub 2 percent deflection. Row sub 2, of course, will be the amount of deflection. And then I'm going to have a slash ul tag to end my unordered list. And then below that, I have an HTML5 form. The action is going to be the process URL, slash process, which I'll intercept in Flask. It uses the post method because it's a form. And I have a name field, a damage absorption field, a deflection field, and a submit button. So now that I have a database and I have my templates, my Jinja templates, I need to write the controller, the Flask application that will put them all together. And so to do that is pretty easy. I'm going to import some things from Flask that we talked about before. The Flask object, the request object, the URL4 module, the redirect and the render template modules. And then I'm going to also import the SQLite3 library. I'm going to create my Flask server with app equals Flask of name. And then I'm going to add a default route of slash. And that route is going to map to a function named index. I'm going to use with sqlite3.connect armor.db as my database. I'm going to get a cursor for that database, and I'm going to execute this SQL query. Select the name, the absorption, and the deflection from the armor table. So select name, comma, absorb, comma, deflect from armor. Then I'm going to fetch all of the rows of the database into a variable named rows. I'm going to close the cursor. When I uh, exit my with block, that's going to automatically commit and close my database. And then I'm going to render a template, my form template, and I'm going to pass in rows as my armor list. So in the Jinja template, it's going to loop through all of the things that it fetched from the database and print them out. And then, of course, at the bottom, I have my if statement that um, runs the server. So if I want to actually be able to put data into the database, I need a function for doing that. I'm going to use at app.root to map the slash process URL to this function named process form. And so first I get the, the form from the request object. That's Flask helping me out. I'm going to set some defaults for my variables. So my default name is going to be generic armor. My default absorption will be zero. My default deflection will also be zero. And then I'm going to check. If the user typed in a name, I'm going to set my name variable to that name. If they typed in an absorption, I'm going to take the number they typed, convert it to an integer and uh, put that into the variable named absorb. And similarly, I'm going to take the deflection, convert it to an integer, and put that into a variable named deflect. Then I'm going to connect to my database, create a cursor, and execute an insert into SQL statement. I'm going to insert into armor, comma, armor of name, comma, absorb, comma, deflect the values question mark, question mark, question mark. Again, these are my placeholders. The first question mark is going to get replaced by the first thing in the list, which is the name. The second question mark will get replaced by the second thing in my parameter list, which is the absorb variable. And the third question mark will be replaced by the deflect. Again, Python puts in the quote marks for me. It understands that some of these things are strings and some are integers, and it knows how to format them. It also escapes them, so if somebody tries to inject some SQL code in here, um, they won't succeed. It'll, it'll escape any uh, quote marks or question marks or anything else that they put in so that they don't interfere with my database. Then we close the cursor, we close the database, and we return a redirection to the index page, which again will print out all the armors. So let me show you what that looks like actually. Um, I have it up here in Firefox. So I don't know if you can see this. Let me zoom way in. Oh, and that's not showing up on the screen, so let's move that over. and make it just a tad bigger. OK. So here you can kind of see it. Uh, it says armor database. This is my H2 tag from my template. These are some items that I've already put into the database. So I have an item named round shield that has a 20% absorption and 10% deflection. It has a golden breastplate with 90% absorption and 60% deflection. And now here's my form. So let's put in a new piece of armor. Let's call it the Midnight Helm. It's got pretty good absorption, I think 80% absorption. And the amount of deflection is, I don't know, 35, or actually this is a, a number input. So we can 
change it maybe to 40. OK, and I can submit. And it's going to put it in the database and then redirect back to my form. And sure enough, here's the Midnight Helmet, 80% absorption and 40% deflection. I think that's actually pretty cool. So in summary, we can use SQLite to store a database in a regular file, just a flat file. To access SQLite, we just import SQLite 3. To perform queries, we have to first connect to the database and then create a cursor. And to execute queries, we use the execute function and maybe the fetch all function to fetch the rows, uh, the results of our query. Have a great week. I hope that you're doing well with Lab 6.